inside the tour. More info at fullandbloom.com. Guns N' Roses dropped their legendary debut album, Appetite for Destruction, on July 21st, 1987. Although the band toured quite a bit following the release, by the time they hit the road opening for Motley Crue in early November, the record, for the most part, hadn't really connected beyond the group's Los Angeles hometown. By February of 1988, the album was certified gold, and only two months later, it was certified platinum. Appetite for Destruction would eventually go on to sell over 18 million copies in the U.S. alone, and over 30 million copies worldwide. They're rolling out like the red carpet. I mean, they're giving us more lights than they usually give an opening act. They're giving us more monitors and more things. Yeah, they're like, they're really helping us because they're, they're into what we're doing. And like, someone told me the other day, Circus Magazine told me that Vince Neil said some nice things about us. He goes, Sides, I figure that any kid that has a Guns N' Roses album has a Motley Crue album too, so this should be great. It's probably, yeah. you think about it, it's I think it'll be a good show for the kids. The best tour. You know, I think, I mean, for, that, for what we do, for what Motley Crue does, what we do. It's pretty it's legit. Like, you know, putting it right together. It's like, who else, you know? It's, it's pretty legit and unpretentious. Regarding the tour, Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash commented, After doing MTV's Headbangers Ball, we had to get on the tour bus to do an overnight drive and meet up with Motley Crue to begin our stint opening for them. Motley Crue were touring Girls, Girls, Girls and were enjoying the apex of their popularity. I had always liked Tommy Lee from the moment I met him. He's probably the most genuine, true blue, heart of gold person to emerge from that scene. I always liked Nicky because he was the brains, the marketing, the ideas guy behind that band. Motley was the only band from L.A. that came out of the glam metal scene that was 100% genuine. They might not have been the most original. After all, Nicky shamelessly lifted entire parts from other bands. But whether it was Kiss or any of their other influences, Motley wore those influences on their sleeves and were so sincere and devoted that you could not fault them for it. And Nicky embodied all of that in my mind. On that tour, Duff and I could usually be found in close proximity to Nicky because we knew that he was always holding a huge bag of blow. Those guys were very generous with us. They took us in like proud parents. And like proud parents, they showed off the house that their hard work had built. This was their third big headlining world tour, so they had their entire stage show going full arsenal of pyrotechnics, a huge crew, months of sold-out arenas to play, the full rock and roll dream. They had developed this convenient system of communication involving walkie-talkies and numeric codes. Everyone in the band's production had a walkie-talkie with a key tape to the back of it explaining what the various numbers represented. There were codes strictly for the crew relating to gear, lighting equipment, and load-in. Then there were the band's walkie-talkie codes, which covered their day-to-day -day needs. For example, one stood for blow, which was listed under a nickname, two was code word for chicks, three stood for booze, and so on. It was great. At any given time, as the situation required, they would just get on the line and say, Hey, it's Tommy. I need a number one, a number three, and if you see a few good number twos along the way, bring all of that to my dressing room. We hung out with those guys a lot during the tour, but Nicky was always aware of how much he was showing off their success and making the band's status known to us. He and Tommy were the only ones inviting us over to enjoy their spoils. We never saw Vince Neil, and for the whole tour, I never met Mick Mars. To this day, I've never met him, actually. As much as it felt like Nicky was sharing with us, it was clear to me that he was doing it to boast a little, especially because we only saw him and enjoyed their privileges when Nicky felt like hanging out. There was always an agenda with him. In the touring situation, he was never out of control. Whenever he did lose control, he was always in a situation where he'd be taken care of. I respected that. Motley were traveling by private plane as often as possible at that point, and for one of the longer travel legs between gigs, Nicky invited us to join them on the plane. It was more than most headliners would have done, and flying Motley Air was enjoyable. The trip came complete with drinks, lines, and aisle surfing during takeoff and landing, a sport that involves standing sideways in the aisle and riding the plane's momentum. Motley Crue was the only band from the L.A. scene that we came upon that we ever worked with on a national professional level. It made sense. They were the only band we respected. But I'll never forget the look of terror on their manager Doc McGee's eyes whenever I ran into him. 
He was dealing with a band on the edge. On that tour, at the end of every single night, Tommy was usually so fucked up that he looked like he was on the brink of dying. My last memory of that whole experience was watching Doug Thaler wheel Tommy through the airport in a baggage cart to catch their flight. He was a heap of lanky limbs that hung over the side, with his head leaning all the way forward, his chin bobbing against his chest. In an article for Seattle Weekly, Guns N' Roses bassist Duff McKagan said, The year was 1989, and I had recently bought a small vacation place in Lake Arrowhead, California, to get out of Los Angeles in the hope of periodically escaping my bad drink and drug habits. Little did I know, Tommy Lee of Motley Crue also had a place up there. Within two months, I was throwing up blood at Tommy's cabin. Nobody, not even me at the time, could hang with the dudes in Motley Crue. Motley kicked our asses. Back in the halcyon days of GNR, when everyone thought we were the most badass and hard-drinking, drugging motherfuckers around, and maybe so did we, we quickly found out we were in the minor league compared to where Motley Crue resided. With their code names for different drugs and private jet, our peek into their world when we opened for them on the Girls, Girls, Girls tour was a peek into an abyss that they'd found a way of skating around the brink of while many others had fallen in. There's nothing glamorous about drinking and drugging, but I must say, these guys at least perfected that dark art for a while back in the 80s. On the time that Duff and Slash tried to out-party Tommy and Nikki during the tour, Tommy Lee said, They did try to out-drink us, and we were like, Oh, fuck. Another band trying to keep up with us. So we went at it. It's Slash and Duff and me and Nikki, and we're just pounding shots at the bar because it was a day off at the hotel. And you could clearly tell that it was, Okay, we're gonna out-party you guys. So we just keep going and going, and Slash is starting to get fucking shitty. And right at the bar, right in between him and Duff, he just blows chunks. Then he's like, okay, I'm back. He was just getting rid of it. Anyway, we keep going and going. It seems like a million shots later, and he lays his head on the bar and passes out. And we go, oh, this is fucking great. Nikki and I grab him. We take him up to his room. His hotel room key is in his pocket. We get it out, open his room, fucking lay him down on the bed, face up. Remember Polaroid cameras? We grabbed our Polaroid camera and Nikki goes, Fuck, dude, get a picture of this. Nikki jumps up on the bed and pulls his pants down, and Nikki put his balls right on Slash's chin, and I fucking rip a Polaroid. Then the next day, our head of security went up and cut off his all access artist pass laminate and gave him the new one. The picture ID was him with Nikki's balls on his chin. Soon after the tour wrapped up, Nikki met up with Slash and Guns N' Roses drummer Steven Adler for another night of debauchery. We were staying at the Franklin apartment, Slash said, and Nikki, myself, Steven Adler, and my friend Mark Mansfield had gone to the cat house. Mark had known we were getting some smack, and we went back to the Franklin apartments. I was drunk, so I just passed out, and my girlfriend woke me up telling me that Nikki had OD'd and was in the next apartment over. The paramedics came, and they had to put me in the shower, so I was coherent enough, and it ruined the whole thing. Regarding that night, Steven Adler said, That Kickstart My Heart song, he wrote it about how the paramedics took that syringe and did that Pulp Fiction thing to him. They didn't do that. I dragged him into the shower with my broken hand with a cast on it. I rolled him in. I put the cold water on him in the shower, and I started slapping him in the face with my cast. And then the next thing you know, the purple in his face just disappeared. The paramedics came in, and they grabbed him like a rag doll, dropped him in the living room, and they just pumped his chest with their hands. And that was it. But he got a hell of a song out of it. It is entertainment, after all. And what I want is Axel, if you're watching this, I want to challenge you to a fight. I'm going to give you the time, and I'm going to give you the place, and there's no backing out now, buddy, and it's time to put up or shut up. 